The terrorist goal is to intimidate us, to make us afraid to meet and to build the relationships and the agreements between us. They will not succeed. Israel hosts an unprecedented summit with foreign ministers from four Arab countries and the United States. What does it mean for the region and beyond? Hello, I'm Nathan King, sitting in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. Hello again. The top diplomats, the United States and four Arab countries, met in the Negev Desert last month. Bahrain, Morocco, the United Arab Emirates uh, normalized ties with Israel under the 2020 U.S. initiative known as the Abraham Accords. Egypt became the first Arab state, of course, to make peace with Israel back in 1979. On the agenda, counter-terrorism, concerns over Iran and the stalled Palestinian peace process. CGTN's Stephanie Freed has more in this report. The historic Negev summit brought together foreign ministers of Morocco, the UAE, Bahrain, Egypt, Israel, and U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. The summit's main goals were presenting a public display of cooperation between regional Sunni leaders and Israel against Iran, coordinating policies as global shifts evolve against the backdrop of Russia-Ukraine, and strengthening economic ties. Including those from Iran, Summit participants sought assurances from Secretary of State Blinken around a U.S. commitment to regional stability. Local analysts say the assurances participants were looking for were seemingly not forthcoming. But the Negev summit was viewed as a considerable achievement for Israel in terms of foreign policy and the country's role in shaping a regional construct. However, Israel's normalized ties with Arab states bring into focus the absence of a Palestinian-Israeli peace process, a process that's been stalled for nearly a decade. For Palestinian leaders, normalized ties present a threat to their national interests and strategies. At the summit, Egypt's foreign minister and secretary of state Blinken talked about restarting the Palestinian-Israeli peace process, but local analysts say the issue was probably raised as no more than, quote, necessary lip service because regional leaders and the U.S. are caught up in complex issues right now, like across-the-board inflation, namely rising oil and wheat prices. Stephanie Freed, CGTN. Tel Aviv. Well, there's a lot to talk about. Let's get to our panel. Nagar Mortazavi is an Iranian-American journalist, commentator and host of the Iran podcast. Dan Arbel is a 25-year veteran of the Israeli Foreign Service. He's currently scholar-in-residence at American University's Center for Israeli, Israeli Studies. Also with us is Omar Badar. He's Middle East politician, uh, political analyst, human rights advocate, and co-host of This Is Palestine podcast. And Paul Solomon focuses on political change, conflict, and regional international relations as head of the Middle East Institute. Let's start with you then, Paul, shall we? Um, just set the scene for us, because this is, on the one hand, a unique summit, uh, uh, historic, but on the other hand, uh, raised eyebrows from Tehran to Ramallah, uh, and uh, obviously some key players in the region, Jordan, for example, not there, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, just talk us through what this means. Paul? Oh, sorry, Paul froze there. Um, that's the beauty of Skype. Um, who wants to pick that up? Dan, do you want to start? Yeah, so I think that definitely was a historic and symbolic in nature. The fact that uh, four Arab foreign ministers are visiting, three of them for the first time visiting the Jewish state, uh, it's important. But it went beyond symbolism as the uh, six ministers agreed on a concrete agenda for the future, uh, having annual meetings, launching the work of six working groups from counterterrorism and security all the way to economics, food security, energy, and health. And so it's very promising. Uh, you are correct. The Palestinians were left behind, and that's unfortunate. And there's uh, certainly uh, efforts need to be made to somehow find a way to 
have the Palestinians join this initiative or at least benefit from it as they are reluctant uh, to participate in Abraham Accords related events. But definitely a good start. Also, it was overshadowed by several uh, a, a terrorist attack uh, in the city of Hadera in northern, north of Tel Aviv, which kind of put the whole thing in, in a perspective in which, on one hand, people are celebrating peace between uh, Arab states and Israel. On the other hand, on the Israeli-Palestinian front and with Israel's Arab citizens, things are not calm and there are threats to this uh, peace and to normalization agreements from extremists on both sides. Well, I, I want Omar Badar to pick up on that because uh, obviously this summit uh, uh, took place against a backdrop of rising tensions there, um, but also uh, with a very much focus on Iran. And there was a lot of criticism that Israel is sort of um, pointing at the Iran threat while, while doing the same uh, with the Palestinians, which some would say was nothing. And uh, do you just want to counter what we just heard there? Sure. I certainly disagree with, Dan, with Dan's take. I think that we should not exaggerate the significance of the summit. This is a collection of governments with absolutely horrific human rights records that have always been <clears throat> in a secret alliance together. And all that has changed right now is that instead of meeting in secret to plot their regional agenda, they're actually having a summit out in public and out in the open. Um, so this is a purely symbolic change. There is no change in policy here that we have witnessed. And of course, this is a summit that is being hosted by a government that is practicing the crime of apartheid, as acknowledged by the United Nations, by every major human rights organization in the world, including Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, and every major Israeli human rights organization as well. Um, so they're actively hosting this uh, summit in the Negev while they are ethnically cleansing Palestinian communities out of the Negev and building Jewish right. towns to replace them. So this is really a grotesque spectacle, and the only way to see it as anything positive is if you're not paying attention to what's actually unfolding or you simply don't care about the concept of human rights and living in freedom and basic human dignity. Paul, I understand your Skype's on Frozen now, and I'm sure you heard the exchange, and, and that, that really sort of crystallizes the, um, you know, two very di different views of this. You know, I remember when the Abraham Accords were signed, um, and it was a, seen as an attempt by the White House to sort of uh, make it not business as usual, to sort of move beyond the, uh, uh, perhaps uh, the tired talking points that, that, that we've heard in the past. Um, or, on the other hand, some people just call it a business deal. So uh, uh, what, what was the symbolism here? Well, I, I think all of these uh, you know, statements are true at the same time. Yeah. Uh, absolutely true that this is an agreement between governments, obviously. Uh, uh, you know, public opinion doesn't hold much sway, particularly in the Arab countries. It is uh, also the fact that they did have some cooperation before, somewhat significant, but it is significant that that uh, cooperation is ramping up, that they're meeting openly, that their visits to both areas, there's probably going to be more military cooperation. That is significant. Now, whether it's good or bad is, is a separate discussion. It is the case that at least as far as, you know, one can, uh, you know, assess and tell, this has certainly uh, weakened the uh, Palestinian position, the Palestinian situation. Israel always was in a position that in order to normalize with any Arab country, it had to offer, it had to settle, it had to go towards a serious peace process to Palestine with the Palestinians. Clearly, uh, they have gained the upper hand and their occupation and apartheid continues. Uh, I think, uh, though it is a significant set of developments, uh, it's partly uh, a reaction to what uh, a number of countries in the region see as coming down the road relating to Iran, a potential nuclear deal which will give Iran more resources. Uh, Iran is heavily entrenched in Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and Yemen and so on. It is a concern uh, uh, to a number of countries in the region. It is the case as well that the Gulf countries and Israel are trying to leverage against the U.S. to try to get more from the U.S. if it signs a nuclear deal with Iran to try to get more weapon systems, more deals, uh, and, uh, and so on. So I think uh, all of these statements can be true at the same time, uh, but uh, certainly I think there are significant shifts happening in the region. And Nagar, that, that sets up very nicely, uh, obviously, um, uh, moving on to the focus of, of one of the key topics, which is Iran. Just before I get your response to how that is moving, uh, we're still, of course, waiting for a resuscitation of the nuclear deal. Let's listen to U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Iran. 
an Iran with a nuclear weapon, or the capacity to produce one on short notice, would become even more aggressive and would believe it could act with a false sense of impunity. Uh, the United States believes that a return to full implementation of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is the best way to put Iran's nuclear program back in the box that it was in, but has escaped from since the United States withdrew from that agreement. But whether there's a JCPOA or not, our commitment to the core principle of Iran never acquiring a nuclear weapon is unwavering. And one way or another, we will continue to coordinate closely with our Israeli partners on the way forward. Senator Gar, was this a sort of reassurance to uh, Sunni Arab states about the deal uh, behind the scenes and also to show a sense of unity before potentially inking that deal again whenever it happens? Well, I think that's what the Biden administration has been doing. We know uh, one of the reasons behind the delay in uh, reviving the JCPOA or return to the JCPOA is something that was a campaign promise of President Biden. It's now over a year of his administration, and that hasn't happened. One of the reasons behind the delay was because the Biden administration wanted to sort of gain the support of the GCC countries and of their Israeli, uh, essentially Israel, and their, their main allies or partners in their region. And it just doesn't seem like that has been very successful from this summit. That's one of the takeaways of the summit, that it seems like these allies and partners uh, have not really been convinced of a revival of the JCPOA. I think another interesting thing from the summit is that it seems like each party came into the summit with a different agenda, with different goals, and also with the purpose of ignoring uh, different um, issues. The Arab countries obviously are uh, trying to gain new alliances and new support as they see the U.S. sort of trying to disengage from the region. Mm -hmm. Israel obviously wants this public show of, as Omar says, and I agree with him, it's more of a coming out of already existing relationship with some of these Arab countries. And it's to Israel's benefit to show, to have a public showing of this. Uh, Morocco has its own um, dispute with Algeria, Bahrain, and UAE have different motives. And Egypt, um, I guess the one that insisted more on the Palestinian issue is in a different place. And then for the Biden administration, what I find a little bit confusing or odd is that it seems like they are sort of latching on to this policy, which was a Trump policy. It was a Trump administration who started this whole Abraham Accord and this bringing in of Israel and Arab countries, while also the Biden administration claiming that they want to have different policies. They were big critics of Trump's Middle East policy and, and strategic views, and they claim to, have, to want to have uh, a different path or forge a new path. So it's still not clear where exactly they're standing. Are they following the Trump policies, which they have to this point? Are they trying to go back to the Obama era, or are they forging sort of a third way in the middle somewhere? It, I, I honestly don't know what the strategy is, but this summit just added more to that uh, third path situation right. that they see. To be creating. Just a quick follow up, Nagar. Do you think this will help uh, revive the JCPOA or get the last I's dotted, the uh, T's crossed? Well, I don't think the Biden administration is going to get a public full support from Israel, certainly not, or, you know, a coalition of Arab countries. So it's something that the Obama administration also couldn't get, and they went ahead with the JCPOA anyways. I think my view of the past year and a half, year, year and few months from the Biden administration is that I don't think they're, they're going to be able to create any new sort of full-on public support that the Obama team lacked. And if they want the JCPOA to, re to be revived, they just have to go on with it and, you know, live with this public and also private uh, backlash from their partners and allies in their region. Obviously, uh, it was also about uh, people not being there as well. I'm thinking about uh, Kik Amdullah, obviously the Saudis as well, uh, but very much uh, a part of the room. Let me, uh, let me ask uh, um, Dan again, uh, but before, I, I want, uh, before you answer the question, let me just play you um, a clip of the Egyptian foreign minister, Sami Shukri, who, who basically sort of tried to push off criticism uh, about Egypt's closer relations w with Israel and other countries? During these discussions, uh, we did highlight the importance of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, the importance of maintaining the credibility and the viability of the two-state solution that uh, for Israel and a Palestinian state to live 
side by side in peace uh, with the recognized uh, borders for a Palestinian state uh, in accordance with the uh, 67 lines with East Jerusalem as its capital. You know, uh, when someone mentions the two-state solution, generally these summits down, it's almost a drinking game, isn't it? Um, uh, you know, and then people move on. I mean, let's face it, Israel's not serious about two-state solution anymore. Why, why are people bringing it up? So Israel's, uh, it's not that Israel's not serious. It's just that there's no agreement among the parties that make up the current coalition. And uh, that when they founded this coalition, they agreed to disagree on the Palestinian issue, but not... Uh, uh, alter the status quo. And therefore, right now, it's a non-starter to discuss the two-state solution with the Israeli government, because it's certainly not committed to it. Well, sorry However, to interrupt. Are... Sorry to interrupt. I just want to move things along. But, but you know, um, Israel's far from being passive, is it? I mean, we, we looked at the, at the crisis, obviously, in East Jerusalem, uh, the continued support for settlements, um, this coalition government very much uh, um, de pushing the policies that, that were in the last government, if you like, uh, even perhaps accelerating them. And that is creating massive tensions. And you mentioned uh, the attacks at the beginning. So uh, this is not uh, some sort of vacuum where you're just waiting for the Palestinians to come to the table, is it? No, no but I beg to differ, because on one hand, uh, I don't see this government as a continuation of the previous government. On the other hand, this government has made efforts to reach out to the Palestinians, uh, providing assistance, uh, adopting continence building measures, and trying to do things that are stopped short of the two-state solution, but at least establish contact. So the mm -hmm. defense minister is meeting Mahmoud Abbas, and ministers of government are meeting with their counterparts. And there is, uh, there are things that are happening uh, very, very discreetly or, or uh, on the economic social front, but not in the political domain. And so, and there. But settlement activity is continuing, and uh, the situation in the occupied territories is very unstable and, of course, uh, leads to Israeli uh, uh, activities in terms of cracking down on, on terrorist cells and responding to terrorist attacks. And, of course, there's Israeli occupation. I'm not a defender of the occupation that uh, has its daily um, uh, challenges that, needs, that, that are dealt with. Obviously, it's okay. not an ideal situation, but the two-state solution right now uh, is far, far, it's not on the table. Nobody's really seriously considering it. And the Egyptian foreign minister's comments were lip service and no more than that. Yeah, it certainly felt like it, didn't it, Omar? Um, uh, at the same time, though, we had King Abdallah uh, meeting in Ramallah. Um, Saudis weren't there. I mean, do you, do you see any progress from this grouping? I, I know you said at the top, no. Uh, do you see it actually as putting back any chances of, of a peace process and essentially moving the Palestinian issue aside from, from Arab countries? Or do we have his sound? Okay, um, we're having problems with Omar's sound there. Look, oh, perhaps you could pick up on, on that question. I hope you were able to hear it. That essentially, do you think this grouping could help? Uh, or do you think the direct contacts, for example, with uh, King Abdullah uh, going to Ramallah um, is more of a useful effort, uh, as much use as that can be? Nagar? Nagar? Um, yes. Sorry, I thought you were talking to Paul. Sorry. So, you know, on the, on the Palestinian issue, essentially, I don't think that was part of the agenda of the, the majority of the participants, right. starting from the Abraham Accords, I just don't see the Palestinian issue being a top agenda for either of the two sides. This is more of a security, political cooperation, trade and business between these Arab countries and Israel. And also, as I said, them looking to Israel, one big power in the region, as they see the U.S. trying to leave or disengage and also with the Democrats or the Biden administration right. coming in, announcing that they're going to pull their support, for example, for the Saudi-led um, forces in the war in Yemen or the UAE sure. going to change uh, weapons for, uh, sales and all of that. So I think 
Um, the Palestinian issue, and I'm sure Omar can speak more to that, but the Palestinian issue has just not been the main topic on the table. Essentially, the Palestinians see um, the, the, at least their Arab allies as throwing them under the bus. Sure. Let me, um, let, let, me just, in, let me just bring in Omar here now. Uh, we've got his sound back. Uh, I, I know, Omar, uh, you not having sound is just not, not acceptable, so I apologize for that. But, uh, but you, you probably heard my question. I mean, can it help, or is this just a, a smokescreen to basically... Um, yeah, there is no business. chance of this helping in any way at all. Look, I mean, Dan was talking about how this Israeli government, you know, is a little bit far away from a two-state solution, and what they're doing is they're offering assistance to Palestinians instead. But ultimately, Palestinians are not a victims of a natural disaster who are in need of charity. They are victims of occupation and oppression who are in need of freedom, and the Israeli government is imposing that occupation and oppression. Right. So, and so, so yes, you do have Arab... <coughs> Sorry, you so you have Arab governments that are paying lip service uh, to the idea of, oh, we care about Palestinian independence and whatever. But this is all ultimately a matter of Arab public opinion. They know the issue of Palestine is still important to them. But none of it means anything unless you apply meaningful pressure on Israel, because this is not an issue of this government or the last government. This is so a chronic issue in Israel where the entire political spectrum stretches from paying lip service to the two-state solution while expanding settlements and gobbling up more land and destroying any chance for Palestinian independence, so, or being open about the fact that you don't want Palestinians. So I just want to follow up. Not quite the race that follow up quickly. So, so what um, what helps then um, bring the Palestinian cause to the fore? Because it, the the momentum seems to be groupings like the Abraham Accords, the focus on Iran. We did have King Abdullah, of course, in Ramallah, um, but you know th that is not moving. And let's face it, uh, there is a lot of Palestinian anger uh, at the uh, Palestinian Authority at the moment, especially uh, the leader. If elections were held tomorrow, well, we know who would probably win, right? Yep, certainly. And watch, watch at the international reaction that the United States is pushing for in relation to Russia about the importance of applying meaningful economic pressure on Russia and isolating Russia diplomatically in the international community to end their military invasion and occupation of Ukraine. That is the obvious answer when it comes to Israel, is that Israel gets to carry out an occupation for decades. And in the past 24 hours alone, they've killed six Palestinians, including mothers and fathers and children, a 14-year-old child. And nobody's allowed to talk about the question of accountability for Israel. And that's precisely the problem, is that until Israel feels meaningful pressure from the international community, that their behavior is unacceptable, that the continued occupation of Palestinian land is unacceptable, then this occupation is going to continue indefinitely. And that's precisely the problem of hypocrisy that we're witnessing, where the U.S., on the one hand, wants international cooperation to isolate Russia, but on the other hand, steps in to make sure that nobody can ever isolate Israel for crimes that are really very similar in terms of what Russia has carried out in Ukraine. Okay, I want to follow up with Paul. I mean, uh, there were some good points raised there. I think could be widened out. Is, is what exactly does this Abraham Accord grouping and people who may be brought in as well into this grouping um, have in terms of offering for solutions, not just the Palestinian situation, where obviously Yemen is just not on the headlines at all uh, here in Washington um, at the moment. Um, the Iran situation, obviously, but there are the serious situations still bubbles. Is, is there any way this this uh, uh, grouping can be brought to bear, or is this just, uh, as others have said, uh, a sort of uh, a, a tacit admission that they just want business links and continue cooperation as they have done under the table all the time? Yeah, I mean, as I said, they're kind of different tracks. I mean, Ahmad is absolutely right, and absolutely everything he said. Uh, uh, the continued Israeli occupation and the settlement policy, which makes a two-state solution almost physically impossible. America has supported this uh, violation of international law for many, many decades across all administrations and continues to do so. I agree fully that uh, the position on Russia, while ignoring the position on, on Israel, uh, is a, a huge double standard. Uh, that double standard is not new. Uh, in the U.S. as relates to Israel, and you know, yes, you're all, right. I guess, I'm familiar with that. Uh, the the uh, the Abraham Accords, and I agree with Nigar. You know, there were different partners seeking different things. Morocco has its own issues it got from the Trump administration. Well, let me just follow. Sorry to interrupt. I, I want to continue talking, but but that's right. really interesting because Morocco essentially got recognition for Western Sahara for, from the Trump administration. Lots of people seem to get little bits of of what they want. And there's been huge criticism this week in Washington that Jared Kushner, the, uh, the son-in-law uh, of the president, got a, a very nice deal with the Saudi sovereign wealth fund. And I remember at the time people said this is more about hotel.
shells rather than ending hostilities. Perhaps um, uh, a little cruel. But, but is that essentially what it was? Was this sort of networking at the highest level, but not really any there there? Uh, well, for Jared Kushner, maybe it was, you know, to get some business and money. And I would, I dare say uh, the people in the Gulf read the Trump family and understood that what they want is business. And I think they, in a sense, bought them off uh, with some money. But I think for the Gulf countries, uh, this rapprochement with Israel, uh, uh, sadly, does not, uh, you know, is not about the Palestinian cause or the Palestinian plight. It does completely overstep that. Uh, but it is about their very serious concerns about Iran and their feeling that the United States cannot and will not be able to do much more than the limited things it does so far. And they're looking for ways that with Israel, maybe they could uh, put up some, some bigger deterrence. Now, in Yemen, Israel is ir irrelevant. We don't have time to talk about the complex situation in Yemen. But it, we should throw into the mix that at the same time that there was this meeting in Negev, more or less, the UAE uh, welcomed the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad in, yeah. in the UAE, which is a way kind of to try to rebuild relations there, uh, to try to see if they can pull them a little bit further away from Iran so he's not completely in their lap. Yeah, Dan, just quickly, um, what do you think in terms of this grouping when it comes to Iran? Uh, do you think uh, the U.S. did enough to reassure the Arab states that they could probably go forward with the JCPOA, or is this uh, still more work to be done? Definitely there's more work to be done. I think that uh, on one hand, the U.S. needs to do a lot of convincing, and I don't think that uh, people are convinced. On the other hand, also, these parties are also concerned about U.S. retrenchment from the region. And the fact that they find each other and they cooperate with one another is also a sign that uh, they're getting ready for the post-U.S. Middle East, in which the U.S. would be kind of uh, pivoting or retrenching. And so, definitely, on Iran, you know, memorandums of understanding on defense were signed between Israel and Bahrain, Israel and Morocco, very unprecedented. Uh, you know, there are military drills, military exercises, joint that are being held. Uh, Israel was added to U.S. CENTCOM's area yeah. of responsibility several months ago, and that also helps enhance military strategic cooperation. And, you know, the day is not far where we'll see also cooperation on missile defense and defense against drones. So definitely, okay. while deprioritizing the Palestinian issue, they do find a lot in common and they do find a lot to cooperate on as they're concerned about the same things. Well, Dan, thank you very much, and I wish we could continue this discussion because there are so many things we could go into deeper. But I want to thank all our panellists uh, for fantastic views, but also uh, the fact that we uh, could exchange different ideas in a very mature way. Really appreciate it. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Nathan King, Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching.